Welcome back. We're going to proceed with our discussion of functional groups. Functional groups. All right, our first, we're going to do eight functional groups. There are many more functional groups than eight, but eight is a nice start. And our first four all have a little piece that's the same. It's carbon double bonded to oxygen. Carbon with a double bond to oxygen, carbon with a double bond to oxygen, and carbon with a double bond to oxygen. So carbon with a double bond to oxygen is seven words. I want to replace it with one word. So anytime I say, I know it looks like carbonyl, but that's not how you pronounce it. You say carbonyl. Carbonyl. So carbonyl is not a functional group. Carbonyl is part of a functional group. So on a test, when you're asked for functional groups, you will be getting zero credit for writing a carbonyl. It's good for discussion though. An aldehyde has a carbonyl attached to a hydrogen on one side. Aldehyde has a carbonyl with a hydrogen on one side and either a hydrogen or a carbon on the other side. Once again, carbonyl, hydrogen on one side, carbon on the other. And when it's drawn like this, we have to learn, as we indicated in our preview of functional groups, this short form CHO, RCHO, forwards or backwards, has the same order, CHO, and oops, I didn't write the C there. That's not good at all. I mean, short forms are nice, but when you shorten them too far, they lose their meaning. CHO. When you see that, don't become inventive. You will invent the wrong drawing of the group. So when you have CRCHO, you draw whatever R is. And if you want the whole Lewis structure, there it is. Or if it's written OHCR, which is CHO backwards, start with the carbonyl. I don't think you need to be told that the number one mistake I've seen over the decades is for students to attach the H to the O. They didn't recognize the pattern, and then they're not going to get many points after that. So aldehydes, lots of interesting aldehydes in the book. We'll talk about those when we uh, just do a brief rundown. We may have a long segment at the end here, just to run down all of these. Why do we do functional groups in this course? Well, molecule behavior depends on what functional groups are present. So the aldehydes will have similar chemistry to each other. Ketones will have similar chemistry to each other. You don't know this yet, but later on, when we study chapter 16 in organic chemistry too, you'll see well, why are aldehydes and ketones linked together in the same chapter? They share a lot of the same chemistry. So ketones, start with the word carbonyl, because you've got to get into your brain what makes something a ketone. Carbonyl that has a C on each side. I think everything here fits that pattern. Carbonyl, C on each side. Stick figure, carbonyl, C and C. And this one, what's the number one mistake I see here? I'll draw the number one mistake I see here. Students will have CH3 and CH and CH3, and then they'll do this. They'll say, oh, I see the O between two Cs. I'll go like this. Uh, 
If you do that, I'm going to put a big X through this thing. The only way to have octets full and not violate the nature of carbon is to put two pi bonds here. And that gives you a two plus formal charge on oxygen. And this molecule clearly doesn't have a two plus overall charge, which means that's flat out wrong. The only way to draw that molecule, I'll do a stick figure down below it. Two CH3s goes to a C with an H, goes to a C with a double bond to O, CH2, CH3. Yeah, the double bond doesn't look the greatest, but that's a C right there. This C is right here. That way you don't have to have charges on anything. Got lone pairs here. And that's the ketone. And carboxylic acids. What do you have on your carbonyl for a carboxylic acid? You have an OH group. It's called a hydroxyl. Is a hydroxyl a functional group? No, you will get no points for writing hydroxyl as a functional group. Hydroxyls are found in carboxylic acids and later on we'll see they're in alcohols. They're part of a functional group. Carbonyl attached to hydroxyl is called a carboxylic acid. Short forms can be R CO two H or backwards H O two C R. You must draw the R bond to the C, then you gotta recognize it's a carboxylic acid because it's got this sequence CO two H CO two H. And you draw a carbonyl and then hydroxyl. And there you go. Don't invent your own short forms. They're probably going to be wrong. And we'll see a selection of carboxylic acids very shortly. Uh, what's the difference between a carboxylic acid and a carboxylic ester? They both have the carbonyl. They both have the carbonyl attached to oxygen. In the carboxylic acid, the oxygen is part of a hydroxyl. In the carboxylic ester, it's O bonded to C. O bonded to C. O bonded to C. And that short form of CO2 H is now CO2 with an R. So your two bends off. Oh, I'm going straight to the answer. That's not good. Two short forms, CO2, R prime. That just means different. R prime, O2, C, R. So it's really the CO2 that gives the same result every time, top or bottom. The CO2 is carbonyl O. The CO2 is carbonyl O. Down here, same story. CO2 is carbonyl O and CO2 backwards, carbonyl O, and we have an R on the left and an R prime on the right. R prime there and R. If we want the lone pairs, they're always two on oxygen. That's its nature. And those are carboxylic esters. They behave very differently than carboxylic acids. They are in a separate chapter in Orgo 2. Let's look at a couple functional groups that don't have the carbonyl, or actually three. And we have all of these, the hydroxyls making a comeback here, but it's not attached to a carbonyl, so you can't call it a carboxylic acid. Here's a reminder of a carboxylic acid from the previous page, carbonyl OH. These are alcohols. I redrew this one as its stick figure. 
It's called secondary. Why? This C here, alcohol, carbon, has two bonds. I'm having trouble writing today. Two bonds to C. One, two. Why is this one called primary? Because the alcohol carbon, one bond to C. And why is this one tertiary? Right there, three bonds to C. We haven't classified any functional groups with numbers until now. We will not be classifying esters and carboxylic acids and ketones and aldehydes with numbers, but we will with alcohols. So let's just do a quick alcohol as an exercise here. Why don't we do one that's got more than one alcohol? And in our example here, we've got a tertiary here, a secondary here, and a primary here. Why? Because this has three bonds to C, this carbon that makes this an alcohol carbon. This one has two bonds to C. And this one has only one. So there you have it, a molecule with three alcohols, primary, secondary, tertiary. Ethers don't get numbers. They're easier to classify. Um, C, O, C, it's not the first time we've seen C bonded to O, then bonded to C. We saw it with esters. Here it is, C bonded to O, bonded to C. So having C bonded to O, bonded to C, narrows it down to two possibilities. Esters if one of the carbons is a carbonyl. Ethers if neither of the carbons is a carbonyl. One, you have to have two bonds to carbon on the O. Two, neither one can be a carbonyl. If you're worried about two carbonyls, like both carbons being carbonyl, that's not, that's, that'll be our ninth functional group. We're not, I'm not even going to tell you what it is. It's a, Chem 242. So ethers, carbon, O, carbon, carbon, O, carbon. There is, now this is another example like the one on the previous page, but this one does have the O quite literally between the two C's as opposed to this disaster when we tried the same thing and we ran out of bonds to carbon here. So we had to make multiple bonds to oxygen and then we realized we made a huge mistake. And there's the correct version. Okay, in fact, let's just make these notes a little neater here. And say this is definitely not that. It is this. Let's do the same thing down here. If you're trying to draw out the O, on each side of the O, we have CH2. You can't even make double bonds to these carbons or triple bonds. Look, I'm going hybridize these. Hybrid uh, structure here. I got the two methyls off here. There we go. You can't make more than one bond there. So this is the one that works out if you put it in the middle. Ethers. We'll look at some ethers very shortly. And then we have two functional groups that have nitrogen and we're back to putting numbers on things. And it's not the same system as alcohols. We'll tell you why in a second. We have an amine, primary amine. And it's not 
look at the carbon attached to the nitrogen and count how many bonds to carbon it has because this one has zero, so something's wrong, wrong right away. Let's go back to alcohols. If we classified alcohols like we classify amines and amides, every alcohol would be primary because using the amine system, you look right at the nitrogen and ask yourself this question. How many bonds to carbon does it have? One, I'll call it primary. How many bonds to carbon does this nitrogen have? Two, I'll call it secondary. How many bonds to carbon does the nitrogen have? Three, go back to your alcohol. If you use the same system, you get the same classification every time, primary, which is wrong. You don't have systems for things where everything has the same name. Why bother having a system? This O has one bond to C. This O has one bond to C. This O has one bond to C. It's not about classifying the O. It's about classifying the carbon attached to the O. That is for alcohols. And with nitrogens, you go straight to the N and classify the N whether it's amines or amides. One bond to carbon, primary amide. Two bonds to carbon, there's one, there's two. Secondary amide. Three bonds to nitrogen, from nitrogen to carbon, one, two, three. Tertiary amide. Watch spelling with nitrogen. You get zero credit if you call this an amide. You get zero credit if you call this an amine. So the D is the one with the carbonyl. There's no carbonyl in an amine. The chemistry is vastly different. So we have to have this straight. Amines are found in a lot of drugs, uh, especially brain chemicals, neurotransmitter chemicals, antidepressants and things like that, stimulants. Amides are found in proteins largely. They, confer strength to the backbone of those structures. Very different chemistry. Okay, so we've got our eight functional groups. And let's look at some examples. Uh, where do I have this? Oh, thought I closed it by mistake. I'm just gonna bring the textbook over here and we'll talk. Hmm, that's pretty big. And that's bigger. All right. Uh, everything on this page is an aldehyde. I will remind you, you need a carbonyl to be an aldehyde, and it needs to be bonded to H on one side and either C or H on the other. This one's called formaldehyde. I will not be asking you the names of any molecules that have functional groups on test one. When we're naming things on test one, it will be alkenes, which have just C's and H's. But some of you have heard the name formaldehyde, so I wanna make this relevant. Uh, its other name is methanal, but formaldehyde is a common molecule. It's used as a, a preservative for dead tissues. Nothing lives in formaldehyde. If you ingest ethanol, which is an alcohol, if you want to be particular, it's a primary alcohol, your body has an enzyme in it called alcohol dehydrogenase, which strips these two hydrogens from it. It's got a good name, doesn't it? Remove hydrogen, hydrogen the molecule, H2, and put a pi bond in between instead, and you have made acetaldehyde also known as ethanol. So this sentence now makes sense. This is the first metabolite of ethanol ingestion. And a metabolite is the product of a biochemical reaction. So acetaldehyde is made in your body. And if it accumulates, you'll feel nauseous. So this is the target for uh, one of the treatments of ethanol abuse. Um, if you stop these further reactions from happening that convert acetaldehyde into this molecule here, then this starts accumulating in the bloodstream and you start feeling nauseous and you don't want to drink anymore. Another note, 
you're going to see acetyl-CoA is actually a very useful biochemical. It's used to make all, every lipid in your body. So you're saying, wow, ethanol makes acetyl-CoA. It's a good thing, right? No, it's not. Uh, while we're waiting for a lot of these steps to happen in the middle, um, there's some damage happening to your liver. And there's, there's a lot of long-term damage of just having ethanol in your body, which messes up metabolism of other things. So the best way to get acetyl-CoA, some of you know already, is from glucose, which we get from our food. And it's a much more efficient process, and it causes no damage to you at all. Uh, a lot of aldehydes are pleasant. All of these are pleasant. Benzaldehyde, vanillin, cinnamaldehyde, citronellal, and retinal. These, uh, these two definitely say what they smell like, don't they? Vanilla and cinnamon. This is a lemony one that bugs hate, so it's good to burn citronella candles. And retinal is an important one. It doesn't have a nice flavor or odor. It is essential, though, for you to be able to see. So when you eat things like carrots, you make retinol, which is vitamin A, and then retinol is easily made into retinal with this same enzyme you have here, which converts an alcohol to an aldehyde. And there's the aldehyde that lets you see. Ketones. Simplest ketone has to have a minimum of three carbons because it needs to have the carbonyl, that's one. And it has to be flanked on each side by at least one carbon. So acetone is the smallest ketone and it's nice for removing nail polish. It's a slightly polar solvent and nail polish is pretty non-polar. That's why it doesn't come off with water and we need more non-polar solvents to get it off, but it's very high odor and bothers a lot of people. Here's a ketone that's used in synthesis a lot. It's not obvious how we're gonna get these rings from this guy, but trust me, these rings are important and this guy is one of the precursors to making those. There's a big ring ketone here found in this animal over here called the civet. It's some people call it the civet cat. It's not even in the cat family though. And I like, I like its British name, Toddy Cat. And it's not even a cat, but my name's Todd. So what can you do? Uh, this is a very nice smelling chemical. Sadly, this animal gets sacrificed to get this chemical out of the animal. And just for the purpose of getting the ketone and that I find that very sad that we do things like that. Uh, there's other musks that have similar pleasant odors that you can make in the lab and animals will not be harmed. And there's a reminder down here, there's going to be a matching exercise on your test at the end. Uh, you're not going to draw the molecules. Uh, you're not going to name the molecules. You're going to match pictures with, in this case, uh, what the molecules used for. Similarly here, you're going to match this picture with, oh, that's the molecule isolated from the civet cat. There's the answer found in the civet cat. Put a D on that blank. This is the one used to synthesize steroid rings. So it's used in synthesis to make steroids. And this is the one used to remove nail polish. So if you had this list on one side of the page and blanks on the other side, you should be able to match them up. It's not memorizing structures, it's recognizing them. And it's a question that a lot of students, even good students, skip because it's a skill. Yes, it, it's worth some points, but not everybody has the skill or they'd rather focus their time on studying other parts of the course. And yes, the other parts of the course are a little more important, but the people that have the skill of being able to quickly recognize patterns, that's that's a useful skill that needs some reward. And yes, you can skip parts of tests and still get 100. Hmm, more on that later. Carboxylic acids, got carbonyl and a hydroxyl. Notice this does not fit the aldehyde category. You gotta watch my words very carefully or listen to my words very carefully. It's got the carbonyl with an H, which aldehydes have, but the OH takes over. 
it dominates the chemistry. So forget about what's over here. That's irrelevant right now. You got an OH on a carbon, that's a carbonyl, sorry. That's a carboxylic acid. And these all have a characteristic uh, biting odor. You've, you've smelled this one for sure. If you smell a bottle of vinegar, you, I don't think you put your nose too deep in there and take a big whiff. If you did, you know, oh, that's vinegar. And that's only 5% acetic acid. So I've yet to find a volunteer to take a sniff of our pure acetic acid that we have in our stock room. And even if we did, I wouldn't let them because it, it's intense. So this one's found in ants. It's what gives you an allergic reaction to an ant bite. This one's found in vinegar. It gives it its intense uh, odor and biting taste. These are unpleasant and intense odors. Uh, they're all, they're both the same. But all, and these, these three guys down here, they're found in goats. And goats have a unique odor because that's what you're smelling. The Latin origin of the word goat has caper in it. And this one doesn't smell. And it doesn't eh, taste. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Uh, but it is good for uh, bugs hate it. Like bacteria do not like this molecule around. So it's in soda pop, even though it's not listed on the ingredients. You'll see sodium benzoate added as a preservative in some ingredients on soda pop. But you'll also see things like phosphoric acid in there, which made the sodium benzoate into benzoic acid. So watch labels. There's also chemistry that can happen between the ingredients. Uh, cinnamic acid looks a lot like cinnamaldehyde, which we saw earlier. Uh, cinnamaldehyde, if you change that H to an OH, is now cinnamic acid. My, my mouse is not, there we go. Um, now cinnamon, if you've ever had cinnamon that's really old, it doesn't go bad. It just loses its taste. And this is a carboxylic acid that doesn't have a lot of taste, so, but it, it doesn't taste like cinnamon anymore. It's like tasteless. And it's what happens to your cinnamon over time. Oxygen in our atmosphere reacts and aldehydes often become carboxylic acids. Stearic acid is a fatty acid. You guys used that one in Chem 141 to figure out Avogadro's number. Here's an unsaturated fatty acid, which is just another way of saying it has a pi bond. The more of those pi bonds you have, the healthier the fatty acid. Esters don't have the bad odor of carboxylic acids. They have pleasant odors. Uh, fruits and, and uh, related well, fruits have blends of molecules that give them the constituent odors and tastes. Unlike uh, cinnamon and unlike vanilla or almond, which are characterized by one chemical causing the odor. Uh, fruits, you'll see this fruit, this, sorry, this ester in many fruits in different ratios. And it's the ratios and what you're blending it with to give that fruit its own uh, flavor and taste. And I'll let you go through these on your own. Esters are fruity, just remember that. Um, there's more esters than just carboxylic esters. Any ic acid makes an ester. Carboxylic makes carboxylic ester. Phosphoric makes phosphoric esters, or you can call them phosphate esters. Nitric makes nitrate esters. Sulfuric makes sulfate esters. Perchloric makes perchlorate esters. And sulfurous acid makes sulfite esters. Ite, ite ions from OUS acids. Real life ester, there's a phosphoric ester with ribose. And this is a, di a triphosphate group. We'll learn about that in Orgo 2. There's ribose, there's a bunch of nitrogens. It's ATP, energy storage molecule. Here's something I use and probably you use every day. Uh, that's uh, dodecyl sulfate. Look at it on some ingredients of, of shampoo and toothpaste, and you'll see it in there. It's a common detergent, good for cleaning. 
Here's a phospholipid. It's got a phosphate ester down here, and it's got normal carboxylate esters up here with glycerol as a backbone. We'll learn about those in Orgo 2. And trying to get done functional groups before we go. I think we're going to make it. Uh, we had a preview of alcohols. We saw ethanol upon ingestion becomes ethanol or acetaldehyde. Methanol, if you drank that by mistake, it's a very bad mistake you just made. Your body makes it into something poisonous, formaldehyde. So it wasn't poisonous before, but as soon as your body reacts, it is poisonous now. And it will also make you blind. That'll go where retinol is supposed to go in your eye. And retinol has that, that insect looking portion on the other end that does the chemistry of vision. And this thing has nothing on the other end. It has H's. So alcohol dehydrogenase is a nonspecific enzyme. You'll probably learn about that in biology. Uh, it reacts with a variety of alcohols, including our favorite retinol, which becomes retinol. So with vitamin A, you will be able to see. Phenol, uh, that was the one that started the Listerine Corporation, although they don't use it anymore. It's an antiseptic. In fact, there's some news lately. Uh, we're, we're having to use a lot of antiseptics now for uh, COVID-19. Uh, th these are all good, by the way, for disinfection purposes. Uh, but somebody may have been putting this in their disinfectant, and if you get it in your bloodstream, you're going to get sick. This one in your bloodstream, you can metabolize this. We saw that. This one, not so good either. Rubbing alcohol, great disinfectant, but don't, don't ingest it. You get acetone. You'll smell like nail polish remover. Trust me, it's a symptom. All right, ethers. We have 10 minutes. Ethers, uh, this guy, he, he changed medicine forever. This uh, ether was the first one used as a general anesthetic. Before that, they were doing operations without knocking people out. So you can imagine how bad that can be. A lot of surgeries were not possible until we could knock people out. And that was the first one. It had a lot of side effects, though. Uh, you woke up with a very irritated throat, stomach area, and beyond. The whole GI tract gastrointestinal tract is GI tract and it got irritated and they got rid of that side effect by putting halogens on the ethers these are all good anesthetics used nowadays and they got rid of the irritating side effect of the GI tract and the other side effect uh, is this is incredibly flammable in fact you can go buy some diethyl ether in a small engine starter fluid canister and spray it into the carburetor and it will help the your lawnmower start up it's because it's so flammable but that's not a good thing if your lungs are full of this and you have an operation involving any electrical equipment or sparks then that operation would be over wouldn't it interestingly the halogens not only got rid of the gi tract uh in uh, irritation they also got rid of the flammability in fact, these chemicals would also put out fire. So next time you're at the gas station and you see those big red canisters above the gas pumps, they're full of chemicals like these. You spray them on the chemicals and they smother the fire and they do not burn. And here is a local anesthetic. This one is not to be ingested. It's not a gas for one, it's a solid and it's ambucane that would be used in uh, mostly oral applications. You put it right on the gums for numbing. Anything ending with cane is a numbing agent. Yes, even that one, the cocaine, is still used in optical operations as a numbing agent. Tetrahydrocannabinol ether has some anesthetic properties. Has, And this one has no anesthetic properties that I know of. And uh, they used to put it in gasoline. I'll let you read about that on your own. Last two functional groups. Amines, 
Remember, amines are the ones without the carbonyl. And none of these nitrogens has a carbonyl. Uh, there's methylamine. Little shout out to Walter White who stole methylamine to do a synthesis of, of uh, amphetamine, methamphetamine, sorry. And it's used for that, it's used for other things. Uh, these amines are all opioids. Oh, I, I take that back. Uh, this one's an opioid. Uh, this is an op. This is sorry. This one's an opiate. Opioid and opioid. Opiates end with a t e, and that means they're innate. I n n a t e to the plant that they come from, which is called the poppy plant. There are four molecules in the poppy plant. Morphine and codeine are two of them. And the others are just synthetically made from morphine and codeine, Vicodin being one and Oxycontin being another. Oid as a suffix means like, not, not exact, but like. Eight opiates are innate, natural. Um, this synthesis is not even a good one for methamphetamine. Not teaching you anything bad there. Uh, this this guy is used as a, it's found in Ipecac and it makes you throw up. So it's, a, it's what you would take if you ingested poison. You would take this or your doctor or pharmacist. Uh, if you phoned in an emergency, my baby swallowed a bunch of aspirin pills. They would say, they would ask you first if you have Ipecac around and it's something you might want to consider because it's effective and they would get it out of the baby's system right away. Unpleasant amine. Uh, these are both pleasant amines, Paxil and Zoloft. They have secondary amines that, and the way they're structured, they work uh, much like serotonin does and they elevate your mood. Uh, I can't let you go today without uh, telling you the most important thing chemically about an amine is that an amine is a base. And in biology, they are often the best base possible in biochemistry. This one is not in biochemistry, but the idea is to react an amine base with an acid and you make an ammonium ion. Yes, I said ammonium. You until now were probably under the belief that ammonium is NH4 plus. You are not wrong, but the category is much broader than that. You can have ammonium ions with carbon groups as well. So it's a nitrogen with a plus charge that makes something an ammonium ion. And the good news about that is you took a chemical that smelled fishy, as most small amines do, fishy or really nasty, like things going bad smell, and you took it and made it into something that doesn't smell at all which is one reason why we put things like uh, vinegar on our fish or in this country, I think it's more popular to put things like uh, lemon juice or uh, what's the other one? Tartar sauce. Both of those chemicals have carboxylic acids, which react with the amine and get rid of the fishy smell and replace it with a non smell. So that's why we often put acids on our food. And finishing up, we have amides. Here's a nice small little molecule that has an amide. Why is it tertiary? The nitrogen has three bonds to carbon, that's why. And this one's a universal solvent. That means it dissolves both polar things and nonpolar things. Some people think water is a universal solvent. That is wrong. Water can only dissolve polar things. It is universal in that it's all over the planet. Maybe you could argue that's a different use of the word universal. Now, Valium, uh, old school antidepressant, has a tertiary, uh, it doesn't have, a, it has an amide, a tertiary amide. And it has a new functional group that we're going to look at in Orgo 2 here. If you want to read about it, there it is. It's got double bond of nitrogen. And we're on the amide page, and I see an amine. Why? I see a carboxylic acid. Why? Well, under certain conditions, you can react them. 
and bring them together to make a bigger molecule. This one is almost twice as big as, as the originals. And when you brought them together, you lost this OH from the carboxylic acid and this H from the amine. And that kind of reaction is called a condensation reaction. Remind your biology teachers of that. They, they prefer to call it a dehydration synthesis. Synthesis is good. Made a bigger molecule. And dehydration, yes, water was lost. But dehydration is actually a separate process where a molecule loses water. And it happens during dehydration synthesis, but there's other reactions where it's not synthesis and water's lost. So learn the word condensation. It's going gonna, it's gonna to become increasingly important. And then when you hit 242, you say, every big biochemical molecule is made using a condensation reaction. Oh, he told us, told us that in Orgo 1. You're just going to keep coming up over and over. And you'll notice that these molecules still have amines on this end and carboxylic on this end. So you can continue the process with another carboxylic acid here and another amine over here and make big, long molecules indefinitely. What do you call those? Polymers. So we made a polymer. This particular one's called nylon 66. Nylons are nice. They, they're very strong. and very lightweight and i know we're running out of time same story with amino acids we have an amine and a carboxylic acid and another amine and other carboxylic acids we have five amino acids we can condense them four times to make this little protein it's really a little too small to call a protein but it's a baby protein and this one is an endorphin i'll let you read about endorphin it's one of my favorite type of words here. And that's all I have for you today. I'm sorry this last segment was a little long, but we got through functional groups. So you can be brushing up on your chapter one knowledge over the weekend. And please start reading chapter two. I'm going to show up Monday, assuming you know the name of the first 20 hydrocarbons, which is found on like page two of chapter two. And then we're going to do nomenclature for mm, a little over an hour. And nomenclature is fundamental. It has no chemistry in it, but you can't talk about chemistry unless you know how to name things and talk about molecules that people know what you're talking about. So it's a found, fundamental skill is very important, but in and of itself, it's not very useful. So take it seriously. You're going to be using it every day. And that's all I have for today. And I wish you a great weekend. It's weird. We only had one day of lecture, but take care of yourselves. Bye.